Welcome to the March 5th edition of the Salt Lake City Historic Landmarks Commission. Welcome, everyone. Um, as usual, we started out with a field trip. Some of the commissioners went and visited the, the sites that are uh, in discussion tonight, and then was followed up by dinner, and uh, no official business was discussed during dinner, so you didn't miss out on anything. The first uh, order of business is approval of the minutes from February 6, 2020. Uh, hopefully, commissioners have read through them. Someone prepared to make a motion to approve them. I'll make a motion to approve. Very good. Do we have a second, please? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. We can do this in a general voice vote. All in favor of approving the Feb 6 minutes, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those minutes are approved. Uh, I have nothing to report as the chair. Vice chair is not present, so I, apparently he has nothing to report either. Anything from staff today? Um, yeah, I have a few um, short items. Uh, the first is that just a, a heads up that the, uh, some of you may remember we had the minor alteration application that dealt with painted brick over on 300 north um and that minor alteration application was denied by the the hlc and it was appealed by the applicant um and just recently the uh, appeals hearing officer upheld the hlc's decision on that um basically stating that uh, the commission's decision was supported by your your findings so just wanted to make you aware of that Excuse me, does does applicant have any further opportunity to uh, contest that? Yeah, the next uh, the next option after that would be to go to third district court. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and then another thing just to quickly make you aware, we, uh, we've had a couple and, and recently we had a request for an extension um, of a previous approval and when one of the reasons for that was um issues related to the fire code and the building code um which the city has had a number of issues with uh, uh miss cromer had actually mentioned that um that same night in a public comment period um and just to kind of let the commission know that the planning director has been working with uh, a number of stakeholders um one of the most important ones is the fire department in amending the trying to attempting to amend the building code as it relates to the fire code um and it's really related to the uh, aerial fire access road um, is one of the things that we're working on now um not to go into too much detail but uh currently for buildings over 30 feet in height um there needs to be at least one fire access road within 15 feet and 30 feet of the building um and the amendment to that would be that that still is in place, but then there's other things that you could do to the building and other things that you could do to modify that requirement pursuant to the fire department. Um, the proposal went to the planning commission on February 26, um, and they forwarded a positive recommendation onto the city council. If any of you are kind of in more interested in those, that proposal, uh, please go to the planning division website. Um, at the uh, February 26 PC meeting and the staff report and everything is in there. Um, and then one last comment is we have hired a new senior planner who is our um, specializes more on the preservation side. Um, that individual in the bow tie is <laughs> Nelson Knight. Um, you will be seeing Nelson a lot more in the coming uh, months and hopefully in the coming years. Welcome back. <laughs> and that's all I have. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to the public comment uh, part of our evening. And this is public comments not related to any of the items on the docket. Uh, Cindy Cromer, please. I am still Cindy Cromer. And usually I speak to you about something related to coulda, shoulda, woulda, and tonight it's could. So you could go to the Preservation Utah 
home tour, which is in Salt Lake City this year in the 9th and 9th community, and that will be on the 25th of April, and it will be all over the Preservation Utah website, and I'm sure the staff will let you know about that, and it will feature um, both contemporary and historical homes, from what I hear. Um, but I don't know exactly which ones yet. And then also, um, related to Preservation Utah, um, there have been some pop-ups. Uh, the first one was kind of uh, just, I've died and gone to heaven. Uh, there was a pop-up for a Taylor Woolley house, and since Peter Goss was writing a book on Taylor Woolley, who worked with Frank Lloyd Wright, he decided to fly up and join us for our tour. So we got to tour a Taylor Woolley house in um, and the south end of Sugar House with the person writing the book on Taylor Woolley. That was pretty cool. Then we got to the P.T. Moran house on South Temple, which I have wanted to get into for decades because of its relationship to my house. And we have three more pop-ups scheduled between now and sometime in May. So stay tuned. Two of them are mid-century modern, and the other one is um, probably early 20th century. So... But anyway, uh, Cindy, stay tuned. When, uh, how can people find out about those? You can look on the Facebook page for Salt Lake Modern. Um, you can look on the Facebook page for Preservation Utah. Um, or you can check with your staff because I'm letting them know. Um, so they, they sort of have the inside track. So if you want to know about the pop-ups, check with staff. Good. Thank you. We always appreciate your insights and comments. All right. First item on the public hearing is Ensign Floral Minor Alteration at approximately 639 East, 500 South. And Kelsey will take us through it. Okay. Good evening. Okay. So Chris Zarek, um, the project representative is requesting the commission approve four cir circular columns to support the reinstallation of the historic canopy. Just a little background, um, and it's very similar to the background given last month since they were uh, similar approval timelines. The HLC approved the adaptive reuse of enzyme floral on May 3rd of 2018. Uh, the reuse considered or consisted of altering windows on the north, the south, and the removal of additions on the east. And the commission approved the reinstallation of that canopy as well. The canopy was supposed to be cantilevered from the west and a portion of the south elevation. Okay, so the historic photo on the top, and then a approved elevation from 2018. Okay, and I know it's hard to see, <laughs> But these uh, red arrows point to the four proposed columns. And see, the columns will be approximately four inches in size. The, to accommodate the columns, the canopy will actually be increased by 12 inches so that the columns can connect to the beam and not the edge of the canopy. The new depth of the canopy will be approximately six feet, four and a half inches. So for more information, the south elevation and the two columns, and then a rendered elevation as well. In summary, staff supports the requested columns and recommends the commission approve the minor alteration. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Would you go through the structural necessity for that comparing, or, or maybe the applicant should do this, uh, yeah, we'll wait for the applicant on that. <laughs> That'd be great. Questions for Kelsey. All right, let's get the applicant up, please. Hello, my name is Chris Zarek. Thank you for having me back uh, this month. I'm representing Liberty Square Associates, the uh, owner of the project. So if we go, um, as, as Kelsey noted, we, um, the, the original design for the, uh, for the canopy had no columns um, uh, out underneath. And uh, I think if we, yeah, if we go to the next image here, the, the structure of the building as we got into it and demolished the warehouse that was behind the commercial part of the Ensign Floral Building, 
Uh, what we found is, we can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, the, you can see on the left-hand side, there's essentially no grout in the block um, until you get to about the 10-foot level and there's a bond beam. You can see a soldier course of CMU standing vertically as opposed to horizontally. And those, that, that bond beam spans between columns um, at a distance of about 24 feet. The block that is under it is, uh, is um, essentially dry stacked, or, or I'm not dry stacked, it, it's stacked and, and um, has joints but no grout coming through. So you can see a section of that wall where uh, at the close up on the right hand side you can see the, where that wall has been cut through the bond beam. There is a, um, it's solid, it has been grouted and then open cells as you go down the wall. That wall is then supporting the concrete double T's on top and then you have the parapet which is ungrouted block on top of those uh, concrete double T's. Now, in order to support, um, yeah, actually we can go to the next slide here. The original awning was supported with some steel angles that were inserted into the bond beam and I, I assume grouted around um, and connected on the back side. At some point, the awning began to fail. We, I spoke to a previous owner and the failure was not so much in the steel angles as the wood framing that was um, spanning between the steel angles. And so uh, the awning was removed and cut off at the steel angles. Uh, our structural engineer doesn't believe that there's a way to weld onto those steel angles or um, use them in a way that, that would meet uh, code or support the snow load on that awning. In order to achieve the cantilever in, um, in the awning, we had designed a, um, some steel uh, beams, some outriggers that were to come out, go through the wall, extend back into the space um, a, a distance, uh, you know, uh, basically two thirds of those outriggers would be back on the inside of the space and then they were to be pinned to the webs of the concrete double T's with some straps. I think if you can go to the next. So I've taken some images of the webs of the concrete double T's. Now, um, the problem that, that we found as we got into it with the contractor in this design is these T's have um, pretensioned, as was done at the time in the 50s, uh, cables running through there. And if you can see the black marks on, um, on the webs, we used uh, ground penetrating radar essentially to try and locate where those cables were to try and determine if there was space where we could even pin through them. The contractor's main concern here is um, if you nick and break one of those cables, you can cause that concrete double T to fail and it will come down on the workers who are working on it. So obviously we're all very concerned about making a mistake. The ground penetrating radar is fairly accurate but does have a variance. Um, and so that was one concern. A second concern was in order to get the awning at the right height, we would be penetrating the wall in the area and through the bond beam which then weakens the bond beam, which we found is really one of only the, the only pieces of structure um, in, that, in that building and doesn't have a whole lot of grout support within the block that's down below it. So that's a second concern. Um, the, uh, I guess if, let's see if we've got the next one here. All right, so the intent in pulling in the columns then was to, um, by doing so, we can um, support the weight of the snow load on that awning on the outside and not have to penetrate the building. And so we have, we'll have a beam that's coming around the outside of the awning that is supported by, um, supported by those columns and then connected to a ledger that we'll create up against the building uh, behind it. So we won't have to actually go through um, through the wall. The, we worked with staff on the placement of those columns. I think if you look at the both historic and um, 
the intended awning that we're looking to create. It has two ends, an inside corner where it um, turns to the west at, at a, the entry, and then an outside corner where it comes out over the parking lot as it turns back north. Um, the, the most straightforward way to place the columns would be to put them at the two ends and put them at the two corners. What we did was move the columns at the corners in an attempt to try and at least bring some of that cantilevered floating feeling back to those corners so that we have the free floating outside corner kind of coming out into the parking lot. That's the kind of dominant, um, if we can go to the, uh, actually two more than the next one, yeah. So you can see how we've moved the column from the outside corner there that's, uh, that's uh, most out to the southwest. We've moved it back to the first step of the walkway that leads up to the entrance. Uh, similarly, the column that was at the inside corner there near the entrance, we've moved uh, southward um, so that those two corners at least get some sort of cantilevered and floating effect as w what we really actually appreciated about the original awning design. Are you doing any uh, structural uh, retrofit or seismic strengthening inside the building? Yeah, so one of the things that, that we did was um, the, the east elevation is new and um, it's turning the corner on the north and south side. And so that, that whole wall will be grouted completely, will be completely solid. Um, it will, on the north side, it will tie directly into a column. On the south side, there is a small section of block between the column and the new wall. Um, and that's, that's kind of based on the, where the T is, the double T up above. Um, there are, we have, um, uh, connections that we have designed since finding the condition of the building. Um, we have uh, designed some connections at the roof to tie the roof double T's to the bond beam, because right now they're just sitting on top of it. Um, same at the floor. If, if you were to um, look at the, where the wall and the floor and the foundation meet, they're, it's, they're all just sitting. Um, you've got the foundation wall the double T which comes in, it sits on about three inches, three to four inches of that foundation wall. And then there's a half block that sits in front of it. So that then the block up above is half resting on the, uh, on the facing block and half resting on the double T. And so we're um, bringing in some angles on the bottom side of those double T's and then pinning them into the foundation wall. Um, and we're still looking for the best solution that we think will actually do the job to try and tie the ungrouted block wall to the floor. And so that's where we're, we've got a couple options here. One would be trying to get some grout to come down into, um, into the block at that location at the floor. Um, our mason and contractor has some doubts about how we might be able to do that. The old, old CMU has three cells as opposed to two and they're offset and they're a little concerned about how we're going to actually get coverage through all of those cells with the grout. So we're also looking at um, what we're doing on the north side, which is we have some steel posts that are going into the furred wall and they'll be epoxied into the block wall and then connected into the floor and at top at the bond beam. So that gives the the block wall a little more rigidity. David? Yes, um, what is the rationale for increasing the canopy by 12 inches? So that is to the, the columns, um, the original design had the canopy uh, ending at the same point as the, um, in line with the walkway down below. And that included a, a 12 inch um, knife edge, you know, essentially an angle. So there's kind of a, a thin edge at the very end of that awning. The column, however, needs to come up into the body of the, uh, of the awning. And so I guess the decision was rather than having the column come down in the walkway 12 inches in from the edge, 
we um, grew the awning 12 inches so that the column could come down at the edge of the walkway and keep our walkway clearances. And then the knife edge will extend out from there. Your approved elevation from previously showed a, uh, a tension member support coming from above. What happened to that approach? And I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I had understood that to be the initial, ele or the, an elevation from a um, previous design. I, I think the, uh, those, those, those tension members were to be attached up into the parapet. The parapet doesn't have any grout and has very little structural capacity. Yeah. So I think in our May of 2018, we may have had an, um, uh, there, was, there was a lot of issues going into that May of 2018 approval, and I think the, the elevation of the awning being kind of a minor one out of uh, all of those. And so uh, I think it, they were pulled out at that point, and we had just, we were trying to completely replicate the initial um, awning design at that point and thought that we had an approach to do it and, and until we really found what we were dealing with structurally in the, in uh, the building. Well, yeah, I can see where you are structurally that that approach wouldn't work anymore. Commissioners, other questions for the applicant? Mike? I just had two questions. Uh, is the, the, the columns are going to be painted uh, to, to match the, the aluminum or, or something in the building? Is that, that what the thinking was? Yes. Yeah. You know, I don't know that we've selected um, a, a color yet, but I think, yes, they'd be finished in some way. So then the fascia is big enough. Are you sloping the canopies? Is, are there going to be gutters in here? It's just everything that's just going to... So the, yeah. we'll have an eight-inch uh, we'll have an eight-inch depth, and the I'd have to go in. You know, it's, I, I I would have to go look at that roof drainage plan to see where that where that is planned. But yes, there should be enough thickness there that we could be able to um, pull a drain down into the structure and then pull it to the edge oh, of the building. Come inside and then then out. I I would think so. I mean, that's how we've done it on the awnings on the other on the other wood framed awnings. But I, but I have to look at the drawings to verify yeah. that, Mike. Commissioners, other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're good on that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there have no public comment cards on this. Uh, if anyone wants a second chance to uh, speak on this? No, in that case, we'll uh, close the public session, go into executive session. Uh, your thoughts on this? Okay, uh, speak into the microphone, please, Mike. I, I, don't, I don't have any objections to it. I mean, the introduction of columns is, is something that's, that's typical with, quote, warehouses of this age, you know, in the past. And it's, it's out of the way of, of the access into the building. I, I don't see any, any visual or historic issues with it. Other thoughts? Well, I would pile on to a... a uh, a question um, that Mike asked just a minute ago, and it would appear as though the original had some kind of an interior gutter, and uh, this may be a good opportunity to request that the applicant, uh, when the, while they're adding these columns, um, that they try and replicate this concealed gutter. Yeah, that, that I agree with, with David and Mike's question on that, how to deal with the roof drainage. Uh, is, is is of concern on this. I think we could probably allow the staff to look through that, but it, it needs to be paid attention to. We can't just have a downspout uh, leader coming down. Uh, yeah, or an external gutter for that matter. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Comments? Stan, Hester? Okay. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? I'll do it. Uh, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the commission approve petition PLN HLC 2015-00237, a request for a certificate of appropriateness for a modification to the approved alterations to the Enzyme Floral Building at 640 East 500 South. Thank you. We have a motion. Could I have a second, please? A second. Motion and a second. 
Uh, we'll take a vote starting from my right. Pedro Ashler, aye. Torres Mora, aye. Mike, Mike Vela, aye. Richardson, aye. Adams, yes. Stoll, yes. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Your certificate of appropriateness is approved. Thank you very much. All right, at this point, we will close the public uh, session and we go into a work session for the Saxton edition at approximately 732 East, 200 South. And Kelsey's up again. You got the workload tonight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, no, no complaints. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the property owners of 732 East, 200 South, are requesting a major alteration and associated special exceptions in order to construct a second story addition. The addition is approximately 1,000 square feet in size and ranges between 25 and 29 feet in height. The applicant requested the work session to discuss the application materials and to receive input and feedback from the commission. All right, the image on the slide is an aerial of the site. The contributing structure um, for discussion this evening is 732 East which is located behind the main freeze mansion, not the freezer mansion. <laughs> um, apologize about that typo. This is an image of the freeze mansion that fronts 200 South. The entire site is noted in the memo. It was designated as a local historic landmark in 1997. Okay, the small cottage structure uh, located to the rear of the property and shown on the screen was constructed circa 1913. The property is zoned RMF 45, which is a moderate high density multifamily zoning district. And the, the location of the property lines and the size of the property make the um, property and the construction of addition fairly restrictive. The structure is located within the required interior side yard setbacks for a detached single family home in this zoning district. The subject property needs several special exceptions to construct the addition within the required setbacks. The requested special exceptions are detailed on page one of the staff memo. Right, and these are the existing photos. The east elevation is on the top and then a, kind of a perspective of the east and south. And I will just go through the plan set and then turn the time over to the applicant. So this is a roof and a site plan. The north elevation, the east elevation, west, and then the south. And I'm gonna do turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. Applicant, please, please come forward, identify yourself, and speak into the microphone. Turn on the microphone and speak into it. Thank you. My name's Alan McGinnis, and I'm here helping Nancy Saxton and Jan Bartlett, um, looking at different options and ways to add a second story to the structure. Uh, and I'm Nancy Saxton. Jan Bartlett. We live together. <laughs> <laughs> they live in that house. <laughs> Do you, you live in the back house? So it's, yeah, it's, okay. not, it's not just the Saxton proposal, it's the Saxton Bartlett proposal, and um, Jan is my husband, yeah. <laughs> That's none of our business. We're one of the, we're one of those. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So our general approach was to try to just sort of go through the staff report um, and look at the different parts and see if there's um, guidance and directions you can help me move this forward. And the general goal is there's a single family dwelling in the core of a fairly well developed block of larger buildings. Um, it's the last remaining 
single family residents in the core of that um, block. Uh, back at the time that it was built, it was uh, 1813s. It was 20 some odd years before the Freeze Mansion was built. Uh, there were 15 to 16 similar sized buildings all around the inside corridor, the inside core of that block. Um, they've all long ago been removed. Some of the old historic photographs that are in the report sort of show clips of the corners and pieces of those older buildings. Um, the 20 some odd year difference between time frames and um, contributions of what's historic and which period of his history we're trying to um, replicate or at least retain um, is part of the question. Is the draw is to make it look like the Queen Anne Victorian in the front, and this was not part of that era. Um, there was a very large expansion and development happening in Salt Lake during that freeze mansion creation. Uh, this was actually done in a, a little more austere time prior to that growth. Um, and so if you all got reports, or do any of you have reports? You got them on screen, okay. Um, I'll just go down through it and sort of skip over the areas that I don't have concerns and try to highlight areas I do have concerns. And if you have spots that you'd like to have me focus on, uh, speak up and I will try to elaborate or tell you what I, we were could, thinking. Could I ask you to, before you get into that, yeah. just tell us what your goal is. What are you trying to get out of that space? Okay. Uh, I'm just coming on board with Nancy. I think she's tried three times with other people to try to work up designs and concepts on, you know, how can we add a second story to this bungalow? Um, and going through those older drawings, uh, they never made it to this stage, um, but they all were quite a bit larger in mass, uh, quite a bit more Queen Anne period or um, far more change than uh, what's being proposed now. And so as I come on board with her, we would decided to try to take a tack of how little can we actually change and how much can we uh, retain from that original character. Um, taking that building from a, a story and a half bungalow with open porches and uh, a dormer on the roof to a two-story structure with open porches and a dormer on the roof. Trying to use the same materials, trying to keep the same windows, try not to alter everything, but instead, if you can, just repeat it or extend it and keep it as it is. Um, and that would be the last remaining structure of that sort from that core of that, that block. Um, can I ask, so Mr. Peters, are you asking, so ask your question again, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm curious, what's, what's the existing floor plan? Can, uh, how many bedrooms, baths? How many do you propose to add? What, how do you envision using this additional space? Yeah, thanks for that. So initially, when this building, um, so the Freeze House uh, was born in, uh, born, was built in uh, 98, and so this came in about um, 13. 1913. And it was originally built as a four-room house. I think they had outhouses at that time, and so it probably had, um, you know, a, a, a bedroom for the parents and then a smaller bedroom and then a kitchen and a living room. It appears from the city that about in the 20s that there was a permit that was pulled and it, I believe from the historic picture um, that is better in the back of the information that you have, it's easier, easier to see, that in the 20s they built two bedrooms, they, they brought the bathroom inside novel thought and had two small bedrooms. The bedrooms are about 11 by 10. So they're tight and um, uh, closet space and everything is very tight. So the back porch was probably open. The stairway up to the, the clearance is about seven feet um, is the height of the, of the hip in the attic. So it has very limited space. And with the pitch, it, it probably renders about 20% that you have that you can really function in in the upstairs. So it's not, 
Um, it, it, it's really not feasible to either do sheds out on because there's just no head space to get some, to be able to use the square footage in the attic. Um, so um, what we would like is we would, we would like to be able to have something more than a full-size bed. <laughs> And so there's just, the bedrooms are so small. We actually use one of the bedrooms on the main floor as a closet because the closets are very small. So um, our intention is, as often happens, those of you who have very creative um, spouses, that the, the house needs a new roof. And um, we know it has to be totally ripped off because it's overspanned, because it had shake. Um, some of the rafters up in the attic are actually cracked. So it needs to be totally ripped off. The whole roof needs to be ripped off. And so um, uh, my thought was, my goodness, while we're there, and we have to redo the whole structure anyway and uh, share everything up, that it sure would be nice to be able to uh, Am I getting some smiles? <laughs> so while we're doing this, so, so we just thought that if we had the chance to go up to get more square footage. So, so right now, the main house is 880 square feet. That is the size of the, the living space. So we'd like to go up and get um, some additional square, u usable square footage and while we're redoing the roof. And um, as you can see, the siding, the wood siding, which is unusual anyway, um, is um, very dilapidated on the south, which gets lots of sun, and on the west side, which um, has taken a bit of a beating. So those will have to be at some point um, uh, fixed, replaced, something like that. So that, that's the impetus, um, is to utilize the square, use the footprint of the building that's there. And then um, parking, as we know in the city, is very, um, very dear to all of us to have off-street parking. Um, it would be very nice to have a covered parking area. So since the lot is very small, to have outdoor space and a covered parking, um, that is the reason to utilize a deck out the back that would then give a coverage for two cars and some outdoor space also, um, which the lot is very small. We haven't changed that lot. That is that is the lot. Um, it's not been anything of our, our doing. That was the way it was uh, when we purchased it. So we're just uh, making use, uh, kind of making lemonade out of lemons as we have to live in basically surrounded by parking lots and condos and apartments. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, the number of um, exceptions being requested seems to be, I don't know if it's a lot or a little. Uh, you guys get one or two on a building. Um, to have three or four, uh, five on a building, uh, the majority of the exceptions are all for pre-existing setbacks. It's for the building as it already exists and the general concept being if we're just building straight up, uh, do we need to jog over to, in order to meet the setback and make a, a foot and a half or a six inch difference on different sides, it's a different amount, or just keep the building sort of intact and not tweak the upstairs so much that you're going in and out a lot. To meet the current setbacks, I imagine back when they built this, they met whatever requirements were not in existence then. Um, and so we sort of adopted uh, an idea of a simple solution is better than a really complicated solution and asked to see if we can keep it that way as opposed to um, moving each of the walls um, the minimum amount to meet current setbacks. So out of the four different sides, three sides already are asking for exceptions because of their pre-existing placement. Um, the real ex exception that we're looking for is that deck, that carport over the backyard that to avoid having to put the patio chairs and stuff around the vehicles, um, put a deck over the top, give a carport, and um, put the patio deck up above over the top of the vehicles. Um, so what are your ideas on what's the best way to deal with the setbacks? And 
you drove out, some of you drove out there this afternoon and took a look at, you know, we're not really close to anything. There's quite a lot of distance between us and the next building. Most of it's parking lot and asphalt, um, but we're not like nudging up within feet of a, the neighboring building. And all the rest of the buildings have pretty much developed out there lots. So the chances are of somebody building really close and uptight um, isn't real strong. So we're not really sure at first on exceptions on setbacks. Should we be following the letter of the law and staying really tight to them and jogging the building in and out uh, as it is? Or can we keep the integrity of the this, this structure and build it up and ask for exceptions? So before we talk about that, let's ask what parameters, just to clear, make sure we're understanding, what parameters do we as the Historic Landmarks Commission have to allow uh, these exceptions? And how does that then go through the uh, approval process if we say they're okay? Do you want to answer? Yeah, I'll answer this. So these exceptions would not be allowed anywhere else in the city. But because it's a landmark site, they have the ability to ask for a lot in bulk modification. So essentially, they're asking the Landmark Commission to approve the existing encroachments, that you're reducing the required interior side yard setbacks so that they can do a vertical inline addition. Vertical inline additions are not permitted anywhere else in the city for residential districts. You have to, like Alan was mentioning, step in your building if you're doing a second story addition to meet that interior side yard. Um, typically you run into wall height issues at that point as well. But because they are, they are a landmark site, they can request that the commission approve the setbacks as is so that they can go taller. Does that help? Uh, that helps. Okay. Are, there, are there precedents? This, this one is pretty, um, it's a big ask. I would say, but there are precedents for the Landmark Commission modifying lot and bulk. But um, for a vertical inline addition, I would have to do some research to see if there's any precedents for that. Typically, pop-up additions are not something that we approve at a staff level by any means, and I think we've had maybe uh, a couple before the commission in the past. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just add a little bit to that. The <clears throat> some of the parameters, and I just want to make sure that we're all understanding where we're at tonight. Um, the applicant is coming for a, as a work session to get the um, HLC's um, thoughts on their proposal at this point. But it's important that you, as the HLC, um, when you are offering your opinions and and your advice, that it's based on the approval standards. Uh, for the project. So this is a um, an alteration to a contributing structure and there's a table in your staff report. Um, it's attachment D and it lists all those standards. It's like any other approval um, where you base your information off of the standards. So it's good to to reference those standards when you're making your recommendations and your, your thoughts on the project. Good, thank you. <clears throat> Both of those uh... Inputs are very, very helpful. I also included this, the guidelines for additions so that you can reference both um, in the memo. So. so attachment D, the is the historic preservation no related standard for certificate uh, for alteration of a contributing structure in a historic district. That's for the actual thing we're constructing, whereas the attachment E is just for the setbacks and those exceptions. That's correct. Okay. So, yeah, attachment D, those are the, the standards for altering a contributing structure. And then E, the special exception standards, both of those are um, analyzed in separate tables, but they kind of... I just want to make sure I'm looking at certain, the right table for yeah, the right of course. consideration. You'll want to look at attachment D. Okay. Mm -hmm. To provide a little... Sorry, I just keep jumping in. Keep going. Provide sure. a little bit of history on this special exception thing. Um, it was it was a change that was made. I don't know, probably five years ago or so in our our code, um, where uh, it really allows it really opened the door for the HLC 
to make some major modification to zoning standards that really are not allowed outside of a of an overlay district or a landmark site unless you go through an actual variance process which is a much more strict process to go through um, the reason why that was adopted is because you know in many cases in uh, our historic districts the existing development patterns that are there don't necessarily match our current zoning regulations so what that does is it allows the HLC to make modifications um, to approve modifications, I should say, that are more in line with the development pattern of the of the neighbor of the historic neighborhood. Makes sense. And that focuses nicely on the rules followed very exactly. Really, make a strange shaped building, and if we want to go up two stories. Um, the flavor and the, the look of that particular building would be dramatically different if we you know, follow it right to the T. And the original sketches were all, okay, this is what's going to need to be done. And you look, look at that afterwards and say, that's just a mishmash of conflicting concepts. And it doesn't hold a, a theme or a look. Um, and so not to fight against the rules, but to try to see that what their historic committee actually does is tries to ensure that we have intact history represented and, and kept. And so I'm trying to thread that needle. And sure, sure. I, and I'm just looking for recommendations or ideas. Uh -huh. I realize that there are no approvals of any sort tonight. And we'll go back and adjust the drawings to, to increase the chances of coming up with a historically appropriate uh, look. Okay. You know, Esther, you were moving around down there as if you had something <laughs> to say. What no, are your so thoughts? Kelsey, this is um, really for you. In reviewing this earlier, um, it seems like because the cottage is a contributing piece to the Freeze Mansion, the restriction is a little bit more... Um, it just seems like it's hard for the changes to be made because it is a contributing uh, building. Correct. So in your review, <laughs> in all the work that you've done so far, what are some recommendations that they could do? Because I'm seeing a lot of this doesn't work. But what, is there anything else that may work for them? <laughs> I, I, I'm not an architect by any means, but, or a designer. Um, you're correct. The landmark sites are, we scrutinize the changes uh, more heavily because they raise to that level of significance for the city, um, architectural significance, historical significance. And since this is a contributing structure to a landmark site, um, I think it should be heavily scrutinized, the change. And pop-up additions, and I've informed the applicant this, I, I don't see a way to recommend approval based on the standards that we have um, and the applicable guidelines. Now, if there's a solution to do something to the rear of the structure, dormers, some sort of flexibility that way, um, I think staff could find that, find support for that. But a full second story is, is difficult. I don't know if that's <laughs> speaking too much. Okay. David. David. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to lead off by saying that um, it uh, would be very helpful in the drawing set to show the existing condition, for example, the existing site plan, and then show the proposed site plan. Um, that's done fairly well for elevations on sheet uh, 13. Um, but in plan view, it, it, it's very hard to follow. Um, in addition, there are no floor plans, which make it a little hard to understand the building. Um, but I, I think the elephant in the room here is, is that this addition, if it's done, if this work is carried out, the building will lose all of its historic integrity. And I mean, I mean, who cares if it goes up, it gets bigger, if you get a building code, lets you go two feet from the rear yard, fine. But th this building will not be historic when it's done. 
I, I should say this, this, this design as presented um, would, uh, would have no historical yeah. integrity at completion. I agree with you, David. That was my concern that we're getting the cart before the horse talking about these setbacks and things when, uh, as per uh, attachment D standard number two, the provisions of how an addition should be placed with respect to the primary structure. It's kind of like we skipped over that. And I, I think there could be ways to do it, but I agree with David that uh, the approach you're taking is problematic in itself and the, the setback issues are secondary. I think we can, we can work with setback issues, understanding the constraints, but just the form, the volumes here are, are concerning. So if we go the second round of proposals that she went through uh, was to leave the first half of the building intact, that original structure that was built before the second set of bedrooms were added on. Um, and then at that rear part, go up and gain all the square footage and have a totally different material, totally different structure, so that there's 50-50, day and night, difference between the two buildings. Um, restoring the front half of it back to what it, what it is, um, and sort of having a McMansion tacked onto the back end of it. Um, and the integrity of what is historic and the look of the whole building, uh, the use of the lot, um, changes dramatically. And to address David's point, there's, our goal isn't to lose the historic value of the existing structure. The, the doors, the windows, the materials that are being used to try to keep that going, uh, the open porches, the columns, everything, the dormer is recreated exactly the same. And so that idea of retaining history, um, I guess it comes down to whether it precludes the concept of, well, you really can't change that building because if you add on a second story, it's no longer a bungalow. And I'm hoping this is, this is a path to um, modify the building to have a second story. Well, you I don't know, know if it means a totally larger development in the back of the lot. There is certainly precedent for inline um, special exceptions, um, but you know, in this case here, we're, we're taking an existing building, we're we're uh, changing, we're modifying the roof line, we're modifying the footprint to some extent, we're applying um, cementitious siding and new windows. I mean, you can go to Daybreak and buy one of these. Did you go on the, the ride today? In the no, no, but I'm very familiar with the building. Okay. Thanks. So it's got the wood siding on, the, on all four sides. On two sides, it's very weathered. And the, uh, no, we're, not, we're not debating that. Okay. But what we're telling you here is, is that the proposal we're seeing will not have any historic integrity. The, as presented here, this building okay. is no longer historic. Okay. And if that's the direction that you and your clients wish to pursue, then pursue it. Have it delisted or whatever the process is. I'm not sure. Is there a what the terminology is, but maybe that's the direction you want to take if, if this is indeed the result that you want in the end. The hope is to try to find a way to retain historic um, integrity and add a second story. So I'm not sure if there's a path to do that. Um, but there, there are publications that have addressed it. Preservation Utah, when they were called Utah Heritage Foundation, with that? produced a, a fabulous pamphlet or book um, that, that specifically addresses this and it's got little diagrams about yeah. uh, form and scale and dormers and all sorts of stuff I don't, we don't need to reinvent that here tonight right uh, I, there are the porches you, the dormers the windows well, you all were, maintain the exact same scale um, okay you were referring to a second story uh, yeah. is is it critical to have a second story could there be something where it expands off the back and to the east. Perhaps you gain your second story back there. Something to break up the masses or get the space. And I can understand your, your description of why you need more space makes perfect sense. Uh, but 
there might need to be some exploration of some other directions that you go. And David's reference to the, the, the state documents might be, might be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, again, referring to attachment D, the standard number two, is a pretty good basis for how to start thinking about this in terms of relationships of, of volumes. Uh, it's... Uh, so a character of a property shall be retained and preserved. Um, so is it possible to retain and preserve a bungalow if the definition of a bungalow is a story and a half structure with an open porch and dormers? Um, the, dorm, the, the idea of the bungalow is going to have to not be a bungalow. It's going to be a two-story residence. I think you just answered your own question. Okay. Yeah. Could I just um, give a couple, and those comments are helpful. Um, just to make sure that I'm understanding, when you say that the roof has changed, the, the, the roof actually of the second story addition is exactly the same on... Except that it's taller, higher up. It's yeah, higher, it's so the form, of the, the, the form of this yeah. building is different. It is no longer a bungalow. All right, good. Uh, it is now a two-story, quasi-Victorian eclectic, uh, revival. I mean, start throwing adjectives out. Um, I want to avoid creating one of those. Um, and I thought maybe by using the exact same porches and the exact same dormer and the exact same windows would retain some of its original. And, 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 and it's creating a false sense of history. Um, the the other, couple of other things that, um, just for clarification, to know the direction to go, and thank you for that. Um, so there, to the back of the property, if um, there was some conversation previously with one of the planners um, about the option of using the back to go up, since the height in that area is 45 feet, which is big. And um, just... It, to the back of the property, a couple of concerns. So we are, um, we are 210 feet from our building to the back of the Freeze building. We're an additional probably 75 yards or another 50 yards out to the street. So the sewer system with the drop um, comes in at the back of the original house. So to add the sewer system back if we add it on to the, to the addition to this house and the backyard. Um, the drop is already, what's the drop of the sewer? Well, this is the Landmarks Commission. Right. That's an right. engineering issue. Okay, but, there we go. But and ar then, ar architecturally or, or, or civil engineering, it, just same as if you were building on a, on, a, on a lot that drops below a street level, mm -hmm. uh, it, it might require a sewage pump, vertical pump, to get the elevation to drop it back to your existing line. You know, those are not as scary as they sound. They're used all the time in, in slope lots. So that, that's a technical issue that can be dealt with. So that's going to speed up us getting through the rest of this. Um, ultimately, setbacks aren't that big of an issue if... The front part of the project um, maintains or somehow retains the bungalow um, in its current form. Um, the idea that we may declassify or change the contributing stat stater, stature, okay. is that a possibility? Is Because I, I think that this building was included to the building in front, the Freeze Mansion. And unless the Freeze Mansion changes that, I don't know what's the path. It would be the Kelsey entire incident. landmark site. It would be a zoning map amendment to remove that overlay. Would the the Freeze does this affect or change the Freeze it, Mansion? It would. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. would be a decision by the City Council. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's it would, not a direction we want to head in, actually. Um, in. Is, uh, the other question, too, so the, the place to do an addition up 
Is, is there any um, movement from it being um, to the north of the existing, so to take in, so about halfway to the, ex the first initial building, there's a, a chimney. And so that takes up, whatever, 12 feet of the, uh, of the uh, 12 feet? Uh, yeah, about 12 feet. Is there a chance to go up, leaving the front half of the original house and start with a second story addition there instead of going to the back of the um, original building? Uh, I'm not sure feel? that's the sort of thing that we want to address as a commission, these hypotheticals without drawings or designs. I, I think that's a dangerous thing for us to answer well, and put on the record. So. I, I yeah. can appreciate that, but not being an architect myself and already spending thousands of dollars uh, kind of shooting in the dark, it would be nice to have at least to feel that if that is sacrosanct, then that's not really worthwhile for me to spend another few the, thousand. I, I know there are design it. guidelines that are written and published by the city and, and, and by the Secretary of the Interior and so on that address this really, really well. Um, and to a large degree, we are betrothed into those as a commission. When you talk about this house and its historicness, it sounds as though you picture this house as being able to be historic in itself. There is nothing that I know of about this house that gives it a historic designation. In itself, it is not that significant. It is not significant. It's only as a contributing structure. So we're not tearing the house down. We're not messing with it so that it doesn't have any of the look. In fact, we made every effort to hold as much of it as we can and yet make it livable. It's not compared to anything else that's around us. Some, it feels a little like we're being asked to be on the block face. But you can't see us even from, from the street. You, you bring up a very good point, which is why you may want to pursue saying my house is not historically significant and go that route. But, you know, that's a completely different route. But no. that's your choice as an applicant. Yeah. Let me ask. But at this point in time, it's a historic structure. It's contributing to the fabric of the neighborhood, and we have to address it that way. Yeah, for better or worse, it was tied in with the primary structure. The it was family. never never owned by the by the Freeze family. I'm sorry. Let me restate that. It is included in the historic designation. Right. right. So we have to consider them all as a piece. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Just for fun, what's underneath your house? Uh, underneath, um, uh, how far down? <laughs> well, that's there, what I'm asking. There is a canal. Canal. Well, there's a basement below. No, he means the canal. Is that what you're talking no, about? No, I was talking about the kind of spaces you folks were saying you needed. I mean, there are really beautiful basement areas, you know, for people to live in and do there's, things. There's a six-foot clearance basement in under this house. It's stone stonework walls i live in a home where we extended that three four feet and it's just an absolute gorgeous basement living area and I, I think you're right i think the mcclellan canal goes under this thing yes it does it does i know it goes right through catholic community services um, it is right here on the map i have a zoning question is in these exceptions that we were talking about were allowed through the landmark um, review process but if this bungalow loses its historic designation, then all the ex okay. easements and all those things mean that the building has to follow. That's right. Yeah, you're, you'd be in a you into pretty a much a pickle strange. there because if you're not uh, if it's not designated as a landmark site and you're or you're not in a district, then you do not get the vertical inline addition. That's not allowed anywhere else in any other property in the city. Um. Okay. So, Thank you. possibly that the idea that going down and doing a bigger basement or adding a second story addition to the rear of the building um, seems to be an option. Um, 
the materials that we were using. We were trying to salvage as much of the wood siding that exists now and move it around to the two more visible sides and use that material and keep it. Um, is there a, a value or is that mimicking history by resalvaging or repurposing existing materials in a different location? Adding wood siding on the, on the second story when only wood siding existed on the first story to begin with. And typically we're, we're fine with that. In the guidelines there, it addresses specifically materials that are recommended in historical applications for this kind of thing. Uh, you know, you don't have to, in, we would encourage reuse of materials where possible. Uh, you know, we don't want to move into hypotheticals, make, right. give you yeses or nos until we have more, more information, but we're certainly open to that. Isn't Recreating the porches as they are now in a higher elevation and stuff like that. I'm trying to learn better the definition of um, when we are uh, creating a false history, sense of history and when we are retaining features that exist. And to some extent, if I want to retain a feature that exists and relocate it, I'm creating a false sense of history. And so I want to make sure I'm not working in the wrong direction. And that idea of having a porch upstairs that matches the porch downstairs, am I creating a false sense of history by reusing the existing features in different locations? I think the, the, the answers to that lie in, in reading the guidelines, and they, are, they aren't uh, strict, yes, do this, don't do that, but they give an approach, uh, and, and I think will help guide you, hence, hence the guideline. And in, I was in, using in those, those guidelines to create this. So. Yeah. Well, take a look at the document that David referred you to as well. Can you? For that, actually, the okay. creation of that. Um, okay. Uh, I have a wife who actually worked on that. Yeah. Well, again, as, as David said, we, we, can't, uh, we can't tell you definitive things based upon hypotheticals. Right. But I think basically you, your, your, your understanding of what we're saying, I think, is pretty accurate. We need to be something that's secondary to the existing structure, respects its appearance, its volumes, uh, things can be in back subordinate. They could rise higher, potentially. If they're subordinate. If they're subordinate. More likely if they're subordinate and further back. Yeah. Then. And we've certainly seen, seen applications where there were subordinate structures that rose higher and were, were sometimes very contemporary in, in their approach. And, in fact, something that sets, sets itself out as more of its time rather than trying to replicate exactly the historical appearance of the existing might be more favorable. Okay. Uh, Shy of having like, a glass corridor to a second. Uh, to, we've seen those. On, on a single family resident? In, okay. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, we could be yes. doing that. I'm not, not saying okay. you, you should or, you, or right. shouldn't, right. but, but we've that seen that's, this. Mike? Uh, I, I guess my comment is, is that um, trying to, to match exactly, uh, to make it look like, quote, is, is, is reuse, historical. Reuse those features. Is, is, is at best difficult. You know, usually it, it just doesn't quite, it, it never looks historical. So, and, and, and the, the other part to this, and I just wanted to make certain that, that, that the couple knows this, in order to add the second story, you're gonna have to go down to the footing and foundations to strengthen that so that because it wasn't ever made to have that additional live load plus the dead load of a new roof even higher so that's that's not that's not just building on top that's going all the way down to the dirt strengthening that and then building it back up which you know for an 800 square foot house there's you know you're going to have to find a new place to live while while this would have gone on you, you know what I'm saying? So, so the notion then of building more space, and certainly, you know, I understand the need for more space. Mm -hmm. There, there might be a better way to build more space and maintain that bungalow look, you know, to an old building and a new building that that you know are juxtaposed from each other, and there's some kind of dialogue between the two two buildings, and it's very definite to see the older building and the newer building, but not this. Once once that happens, then then it's not either new world anymore. Mm. 
Does that, does that make sense? It does. It's helpful. Thank you. And in doing that, we'll certainly run into uh, setback and zoning issues, but we have the ability and the willingness to consider all those in the context of trying to deal with the yeah, hi historical the nature. So Correct. A give and take. Correct. Yeah. Well said, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that uh, ends this meeting. Thank you very much. See you April 2nd.